All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you are having a, a better morning uh, than WebEx is. <laughs> um, but we are going to go ahead and, and jump in. I am recording this, uh, so if you have any colleagues or anything that um, we're not able to get in or are not able to join us today, uh, they can still access all of this information. Uh, so, as many of you know, my name is Christine Flynn. I'm a grant manager here with the Office of Illinois Works Pre-Apprenticeship Program. And today we're going to be walking through the participant life cycle from a grantee perspective. So, this uh, idea actually came out of a number of requests last year into this year uh, from our grantees just really wanting to get kind of an overview of everything that kind of falls within their realm of responsibility uh, and we've structured it so that it follows that same participant life cycle so it's going to kind of jump between the different staff roles um, and talk about what each uh, role is responsible for and then in between kind of each step uh, I'm going to talk with you a little bit about some of the documents that are there as resources for you, some of the required documents, and then also give you some kind of snapshots of IWRS. So you can follow along both uh, from a programmatic standpoint, as well as what is required uh, from that technology standpoint. So let's go ahead and get started. So first up is I just wanted to kind of give you all a refresher on our pre-apprentice life cycle. Uh, this is going to guide our, our uh, session today, as I said. Uh, so this will look very familiar to most of you, uh, and it just tracks kind of from the very first um, interaction with that participant through their application, their intake into their support services, their training, program completion, transition services, and then follow up. So it's just kind of taking them all the way through this process. And so our first step here is going to be outreach and recruitment. So you can see here uh, that very first interaction with that participant is going to be with your outreach and recruitment coordinator. So they're going to engage with that potential participant through some sort of outreach and recruitment activity. Uh, so this can be anything from uh, there's an Instagram post that goes out to you're at an open house and that individual comes in. Perhaps you're at a job fair or, you know, there's been a flyer up. There's been some sort of engagement between that kind of outreach and recruitment team and that participant. And so when that outreach and recruitment coordinator interacts with that participant, they're then going to go ahead and their first step is going to put them into IWRS as a lead. Uh, so many of you will remember that we have four different lead categories. Uh, so the vast majority of your leads when you're putting them into IWRS are going to be in those kind of hot and warm stages. So these are the people that are really interested in the program. They want to move forward either with an application or they're just showing interest and they want to get more information. Uh, now your cold or closed leads, these are individuals who, you know, maybe you followed up with them uh, and they're not really being responsive or they've out and out told you that they do not want to move forward. Most often what we see is that someone will start at a hot or warm lead and then they'll drop into cold or they'll drop into closed. So it's very, very rare that we see kind of cold or closed leads right from the start. So now depending on uh, what lead type this participant is, you're gonna go ahead and take your next step. So if they are hot, warm, or cold, you are going to conduct your normal follow-up. So uh, phone calls, emails, uh, if you contacted them through social media, you can try to contact them through social media again, uh, whatever that might be. But it's important to remember that what we see is generally it takes around seven you know, contacts uh, with that individual or seven touches with that individual uh, for them to really engage in the program. 
And so that could be them seeing a flyer, seeing your Instagram post, getting a phone call, getting a follow-up phone call. So any kind of interaction they have with your program, we would consider a touch. And that's all part of that kind of follow-up. So it's really kind of making sure that they have all of the information that they need to try to get them to the stage where they're ready to move forward in the process. So the next step, uh, your outreach and recruitment coordinator is going to complete the pre-screen assessment with that individual, uh, assuming that they want to move forward in the program, right? So if they're a hot lead, they're gonna go straight into that pre-screen assessment. If they're a warm lead or a cold lead, you'll do follow-up. Hopefully that gets them uh, into that kind of hot lead status. And then again, you'll move into the pre-screen assessment. So let's take a look at some of our outreach and recruitment tools. Uh, so the first one is this flyer. Uh, so you all have access to this template uh, and this can offer you kind of a simple way to uh, advertise your Illinois Works program. Uh, of course, you are not required to use this flyer, but it's available if you would like to use it. Uh, we do have it in a Word doc format as well as a PDF format, uh, whatever works for you. Uh, so this is available on the partner guide. Next up, we have our one-sheeter. Uh, so this is really for those participants, maybe in their, they're in that warm lead state and they wanna get more information about the program. So this will give them uh, in, detailed information about the curriculum. It will give them detailed in, information about support services, stipends, anything that's really uh, pertinent information for them, that's what should go on this one-sheeter. Again, you're not required to use this format. Uh, we do offer a template, uh, as you can see on the screen here. Uh, but if you have a format that you like that still communicates you know, all of this detailed information, you can use that as well. Now, those first two were more kind of external facing documents. This marketing plan is an internal facing document. Uh, so all of you have kind of gone through the process of creating a, a marketing plan, uh, whether you used this worksheet or one on your own. Uh, this tool is really just meant to help you all kind of organize where your marketing is going to go. What target audience will you be focusing on? How will you be measuring success for your marketing? Uh, and one thing that's really important when you're thinking about marketing is oftentimes we'll think, oh, well, the success of our marketing is how many people uh, show up to our open house or how many people, um, you know, click like on our Facebook post or something like that. And it's important to really kind of begin to look at other factors as well uh, of success. So certainly, you know, how many people show up to our open house or how many people kind of complete that full outcome but it's also kind of how many people we can engage with. So even if it's just they're, um, maybe they're not liking your page, but they're, uh, they're going to your website. So tracking kind of your website traffic um, and other interactions like that, where it can kind of get to uh, those behaviors. Uh, so how are they interacting with your content? How are they actually carrying through? because that's how you know that you're completing those touches, even if your staff isn't actually talking to that person. So I think that's something that's really important. Again, this tool is available uh, for your use. I believe everyone um, either use this or something that they have internally. Uh, if you ever want a copy of just a blank one, uh, let us know, we're happy to provide uh, that to you as well. So next up is our heat map. Uh, so this is something that uh, all of you have access to, that the public has access to as well. Uh, and on this heat map is all of our grantees um, in gold stars. Uh, so this is actually going under uh, some, a little bit of renovation right now. Uh, the team at SIU is working to update this map to make sure all of your uh, names and websites, uh, your landing pages are visible on this map. Uh, but this tool is really helpful uh, to kind of funnel individuals uh, through our site and then to your sites. 
So whenever you get an email from us saying, you know, hey, we had someone reach out, we have a referral for you, it's very often this is where that individual is coming from. Uh, they have found us online, they've submitted an interest form, and then we're referring them out to the location that's closest to them. Um, and then we will often, if they have certain specific uh, goals in mind, so if they're looking for a certain curriculum or something like that, we'll make sure to refer them um, also to those curriculums, even if they're maybe a little further out uh, geographically. So next up, uh, this is just, uh, again, just kind of a helpful tool. Uh, so if you're planning to run an open house type event, uh, this document just gives you tips for running an open house. Uh, next up is the work plan. So I'm sure all of you are very familiar with this uh, document by now, uh, but this helps to kind of structure uh, your program dates, how many individuals you're looking for. So this is kind of the background uh, fuel for your outreach and recruitment uh, because you're trying to reach a certain number of individuals to ensure that you're enrolling a certain number of individuals. Uh, but it also helps you plan out your cohorts. So uh, this can help you start to plan your recruitment dates. So if you know you need 25 individuals by July 1st, you can start to backtrack and determine when do we need to start doing outreach? When do we need to start doing recruitment? Again, you all have access to this um, uh, because this is what you have all submitted um, to us to determine those dates. Um, but, you know, for whatever reason you ever need uh, an updated copy, just let us know. Now, these next two are focused on IWRS. So uh, if you are the individual who's putting in these participants, you'll recognize this screen. Uh, this is where you choose that initial lead, uh, lead type, I should say. And then the next one is your pre-screen assessment. So again, if you remember, you kind of determine that lead, and then depending on that, you're gonna move them into this pre-screen stage. So if they wanna move forward with the program, they can move to this pre-screen stage. Uh, and this is where you're doing kind of a little bit more in-depth eligibility check. So uh, are they, 18 years or above? Do they have a high school diploma? Are they an Illinois resident? Are they interested in the construction industry? And then this is also where we're capturing demographic information for them. Uh, so we've had some questions about collecting demographic information at this stage. Uh, that is actually part of the Illinois Works Jobs Program Act that we have to track demographics not only for those enrolled, uh, but for all of our applicants. So people who are interested in the program uh, and that's why that's at this stage as well. So now we are uh, moving into our application. So we're kind of assuming our student is eligible, they've made it through the pre-screen assessment. And this is when your outreach and recruitment coordinator is gonna go ahead and do the application. Uh, so we do have a paper option for the application if, if you wanna utilize that but I think most people do put it straight into IWRS. Um, so that's what I have listed here. And once that individual goes to the application, the outreach and recruitment coordinator is gonna determine if the applicant is eligible to be selected for an interview. Uh, so this is at the stage where we're really just making sure, reconfirming their education, reconfirming their date of birth, making sure that they are an Illinois resident, uh, they can meet all of the requirements of the program. Uh, and if they are selected for an interview, we will go to one of our yes branch here. And then two staff members will conduct the standardized interview using the Illinois Works interview sheet. And then those sheets will be uploaded to IWRS. Now, keep in mind, those sheets do have a scoring system on them. So please review that. Uh, because we will ask for an interview score as well, which is the average of these two staff members' interview sheets. Now, if that individual is not chosen for an interview, uh, the Outreach and Recruitment Coordinator will provide that individual with referrals, with resources, and then in IWRS, that person would be listed as not enrolled. Uh, so that status just means during that kind of application process, 
this person was either um, determined they were not eligible or they backed out. So they decided they didn't want to move forward. So let's look at a couple of the tools at this stage. So that first one is this application. Uh, so we have a version of the paper application, and then we have the IWRS application. Then we have interview sheet. So here you can see our standard interview sheet. This is the required sheet that all programs need to utilize. Uh, and the scoring is outlined in the directions of this sheet. So uh, please make sure to read those. Uh, we're trying to kind of standardize this process so that we can utilize these scores across the board to kind of see what, what uh, scores we're getting um, for our students who's being accepted. Um, this is also really important because individuals who score less than a 32 uh, there, they should not be accepted to the program unless there are some sort of mitigating circumstances. Uh, so those scores really do serve a purpose um, when it comes to accepting a participant to the program. And then this last sheet is the applicant or slash participant referral form. Uh, so this is something you can utilize. Uh, many of you already have kind of a referral system or for a referral form you use. Uh, but if you don't have one, feel free to use this one. Uh, and then I see Kyle, you have a question. Um, if you want to unmute, you can ask now, or if you want to put it in the chat, that's great as well. Yes, Christine. So going back to the interview um, questionnaire scores. So yes. I've been just putting in like the actual like 37 out of 40. I haven't been computing that into a percentage. Is That's there, perfect. is that okay? Which yeah. one would you prefer? Yeah, so uh, we we usually just look for the actual raw number as the average. Um, we do have some people who do percentage and, and that's fine. We can kind of work it out on our end, uh, but we are just looking for that raw number. Wonderful, thank you so much yeah. for cl clarification. Yeah, great question. Thanks, Kyle. All right. So we went through our referral form. Uh, so now we are getting into um, kind of continuing our application stage. They've gone through the interview, uh, and if they pass that interview, you know they they've reached that 32. Uh, we're going to now determine that the participant has met that program criteria and determine their enrollment status. So there are three kind of um, program, uh, or I'm sorry, um, like program notification uh, that we can give them. Uh, statuses, acceptance statuses, let's call them. Um, the first one is full acceptance. So this means that they've met all of the eligibility. We have documents that verify, yes, they do have a high school diploma. They are an Illinois resident. They are 18 and above. Um, all of that is set. They get full acceptance. Uh, the next stage is conditional acceptance. So conditional acceptance usually means that there's something we weren't able to verify. So it could be they're working to get their high school transcripts. I know sometimes those can be hard to, to get, especially if the school has shut down or something, there could be some um, delay in that. Um, they don't have proof of uh, residency. They can't give you proof of their age, something like that. Um, but in those uh, acceptance letters, you'll outline, you know, this is conditional acceptance pending that we have verification of these items. And then the last status is denial. So um, that's pretty, pretty clear. Uh, they did not make it into, into the program. Um, and so if they've gotten full acceptance or conditional acceptance, you're going to send them uh, their enrollment decision letter. Uh, so this is something you can, uh, most of them, I believe, are now sent via email. If you would like to send it by snail mail, you are you're more than, um, <laughs> we're open to that as well. It just depends on kind of how your, your program wants to function on that side. Uh, but we are good with email if you want to do that. And then uh, with the denial, uh, you'll just issue that denial letter. And in that denial letter, you want to make sure to offer any sort of resources or referrals at that point as well um, to make sure that we're not just kind of leaving that person out there and saying, well, you're not eligible for us. So, you know, figure it out. We always want to make sure that there's kind of a next step for everyone, even if our program is not the next step for them. 
so this is just examples of our enrollment letters. Um, again, if you have your own enrollment letter, please utilize that. Uh, but these templates are available for you if you'd like to use these. Um, and then you can see uh, all the way to the left here, we have our conditional letter. Um, and then we have, um, sorry, I apologize. Um, it's, this is our full and then our conditional and then our denial. So, um, hold on. No, I messed these up. I'm so sorry. The middle one is our denial letter. Um, anyways, all of these are available to you. Um, they're all on the Illinois Works Partner Guide. They're also in the appendix um, of the grantee manual. Uh, so if you want to utilize these, please do so. So now our individual has been accepted to the program. Uh, they're going to move on to the next stage, which is intake and wrap around services. Uh, so this is when they're going to meet with that wrap around service coordinator. So up until this point, uh, they've really just been interacting kind of with your outreach and recruitment team. Uh, they've had some interaction potentially with other staff members through that interview process. And now they're coming in and they're meeting with uh, your wraparound supports uh, coordinator uh, and your support staff. So this is when your wraparound service assessment is completed. Uh, and these should be completed straight into IWRS. Uh, just as a reminder, kind of some of the allowable uh, wraparound services are apprenticeship application fees, transportation, childcare, technology rental or assistance, uh, alumni networking, mentoring, financial literacy, but we know that there are other needs that participants have. Uh, so if something falls out of this range, uh, just get in touch with your grant manager and they can let you know if that's something that is allowable. Uh, but at this stage, you're just putting that assessment straight into IWRS for that participant. And then also at this stage, I, these um, don't necessarily happen at this stage, but I think it's important to talk about um, the need for discrimination, harassment, and bullying policies internally. Uh, so if you do not have a policy like this, we have created a policy as well as a complaint form and kind of a process form that you can follow if there is a complaint. Um, this is extremely important because we always want all of our participants to know that we're creating kind of this inclusive environment and that if there is you know discrimination harassment bullying going on that it's going to be taken seriously and something is going to you know it's going to get the investigation that it deserves and if it's you know found to be that that is happening that it's addressed um, so I, I put this here just because it's something that we really always want to make sure we're supporting all of our participants in and making sure that they feel included and that, you know, this will be addressed if it's happening. The next up is our wraparound service screening. Um, so for those of you who have filled these out, this will, will look very familiar to you. Uh, you just go through an IWS and select if that person is opting in or not. And then the system will automatically carry over any of the services that they have opted into. They'll carry it over to that individual's career plan for you. Um, so if you add transportation, transportation will pull through, driver's education fees, driver's education fees will pull through, whatever might be chosen there. And then you can see here, uh, this is where those services will show up. So in this instance, that individual needed uh, financial literacy and transportation. So the system automatically pulled it to their career plan uh, under that wraparound services goal. So are there any questions at this point before we move to our next section? Feel free to unmute or put it in the chat. So, Christine, at this point, would we be having them, um, so we, don't we have to print out a career plan form and have them sign it and upload it to the system? Does that come now or does that come at the end of the program? Um, so, they have to, are you talking about the, the commitment agreement, that one? 
No. So it, so one of my supervisors in another program said he, he got audited um, on his program and it said he was missing all his like career plan forms. And so when I go to just the overview, it says view and print career plan form. So when I do that, then it pulls up like assessments, desired career path, accomplishments, career plan and goal. And then it says customer signature, and then it has grantee signature underneath it. I'm just... yeah, so, so that's actually not, um, that, that I know what you're talking about. That's not part of our, our program. Um, so what we do ask them to fill out and is coming up in just a second is they will do a career assessment. Yes. Um, that one. Is that yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, I, I yeah. know what, what that one is. I was just wondering because he said, oh, just make sure that you have this because you're going to get docked, um, if you don't have it. So, and then I was confused because I never heard about this. So maybe our programs are just different and we need different things for each program. Yeah, yeah I would just, um, if he's working on like a different DCEO program, um, he is. I would just double check with us because we don't follow the same requirements that like Apprenticeship Illinois does or WIOA or JTED or any of those. We're kind of a separate entity. Um, so great question because i think there's a lot of organizations that kind of overlap um but we don't require that specific item that he's referring to uh, we have a separate a separate item and that is coming up in just a second perfect thank you yeah, yeah absolutely all right so now we are getting into training and uh, Kyle did a really great job of segueing us into this because we are now going to talk about um, the orientation career assessment and commitment agreement. Uh, so once your participant has been accepted, they've gone through uh, their intake process and now we are getting into kind of the training aspects. Uh, so many of you are going to have your orientation likely on the first day of instruction. I know some people have it slightly before, um, but either way, you're going to host a participant orientation. And during that orientation, you're going to complete the orientation career assessment. And that assessment is asking them kind of basic information for you to get a baseline about where they are as far as do they have a resume? Do they need to update that resume? How comfortable do they feel interviewing? Um, do they already have chosen trades that they're interested in? What are their goals? So here is, you know, do they want to go? And the only place they want to go is union, or are they open to union or non-union registered apprenticeship programs? Or do they only want to go union? And if they can't go union, they want to go just to construction employment. So this is where you're really getting kind of in a detailed understanding of what are their goals, what trades are they interested in, and where do they stand right now? So you can make sure to be kind of structuring the program or offering them additional assistance throughout the program uh, to make sure that they have all of those items before they leave uh, and finish with you. So uh, once someone attends kind of that, that orientation, if it's on the first day of instruction, um, or if it's before, um, they're going to complete that career assessment as well as signing their commitment agreement. That commitment agreement is just going to outline the basics of your program. So what you're asking them to do. Uh, so how many days a week it's going to be, how many hours uh, you'll, you'll put in there kind of um, conduct items um, as well as a, a FERPA statement. So. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with FERPA, um, it is a federal law that essentially uh, states that someone's data, their personal information as a student is protected. Uh, so that commitment agreement actually waives the FERPA agreement for our staff. Um, so it essentially allows us to access any of the data that you put into IWRS. And without that statement and without that agreement, uh, we actually technically can't access their data. So it's really, really important that we have that commitment agreement. Uh, so that career assessment commitment agreement will happen during orientation. Uh, if they show up to orientation that first day of instruction, 
uh, you will then mark them as enrolled in IWRS. And that's very, very important. So up until this point, up until they actually show up for that orientation, for that first day of instruction, they are not enrolled. So they are still seen as an applicant up until this point. It's not until they actually show up on that day that we consider them as enrolled. If they do not show up on that day, um, they're not present, your team tries to follow up, they're not getting a response, um, then that person's going to be marked as administrative withdrawal. Uh, so the really important thing about that is that uh, all of our metrics kind of flow from that enrolled metric. So if you have individuals listed as enrolled and they're actually not, um, it's going to really skew kind of your later completion metrics or your primary transition metrics. So you really want to make sure that only the people who actually showed up for at least that, you know, that first day, they are marked as enrolled. Are there any questions about that? Because I really want to stress the importance of that. Okay, I'm not, I don't see any in the chat, I'm not hearing anyone. So I'm gonna go ahead and move on now. Um, so these are uh, just a couple, again, tools that you can use. So this is just a sample orientation agenda. If you have your set agenda that you, you normally do during orientation, totally fine to use that. Uh, we just wanted to provide one in case uh, for programs who didn't have one. You can see we kind of provide a little bit of an outline um, of you know, what can be talked about during that, how long it should be. Uh, we also provide some kind of sample icebreakers and introductions uh, if you want to use that as well. Then this next sheet is our career assessment, uh, the orientation career assessment. Uh, you can see here again, it's this is just really getting their baseline of their job readiness. It's trying to understand their primary goal, their secondary goal. Uh, and then on that second page, it's gonna have a listing of, of the different trades they might be interested in. Um, of course, if they have something not on this list, you can add that as well. Um, but we've uh, tried to capture kind of the most uh, popular ones or the ones we've seen most often. So this will be filled out, uh, this one will be filled out on paper and then added to IWRS. And then this final item is our commitment letter. So again, um, this letter is extremely essential. Uh, this is the format that needs to be utilized. Uh, you can add in your program name, your dates, start dates, your program address, all of that. Uh, but we ask you to use this letter because of this final statement right here. Uh, and this statement is that Family Education Rights and Privacy Act or FERPA uh, and without this signed, uh, we technically cannot access their data, um, which then, of course, um, puts us into kind of a, a precarious situation. Um, if we're not allowed to access their data, that technically means we can't, you know, count them into your compliance. So it's really important that we have this letter signed. So now we get into that individual has attended. They're now enrolled. Uh, your instructor or instructional partner is going to deliver training um, following your approved curriculum. And this is when your data entry coordinator is starting to track attendance, track post assessment scores, credentials. Uh, and then I just placed our kind of participant performance thresholds here for you. Just as a reminder, attendance needs to be 80% or above per module and 70% or, uh, or above for post assessments. Uh, the one caveat here is OSHA 10 actually requires 100% attendance. Um, so even though we only, um, our threshold's 80% for OSHA, you have to have 100% or they will not certify that individual. So that's the one kind of exception to our thresholds here. And then um, the next step is you're going to be paying out stipends to your participants based on their performance. Um, so I've placed this here just kind of 
so that we can talk about it. I know some of you have different structures on how you pay out stipends, um, but it's just really important to make sure that those stipends are based on the performance of the participants. So it's not just, well, this person was here for four hours, this is how much we're paying them out. Um, it's that they're really kind of moving forward in the program, they're finishing those certificates, they're finishing, they're, you know, meeting their post-assessment scores, um, and they're meeting their attendance. The reason that we kind of pull that away just from attendance is, one, we really want to make sure that, you know, we're actually training people to get these skills, that when they're walking out, they can walk onto a construction site, they can walk into a registered apprenticeship program, and they can start building off of the skills they learned in this program. And two, we don't wanna just go off of attendance because we really wanna make sure that this is not seen as a wage. Uh, so we wanna make sure this does not appear like it's this amount just for being there for four hours and there's no other component to it. So those are the two reasons it's really important. Um, let's see, I have a question in the chat from V. Angela. So she says, does a student have to complete flagger in order to be set to completion. Um, so Fee Angela, if Flagger is part of your curriculum, so that is part of the approved curriculum, yes, they will need to complete that. Um, if it is not part of your approved curriculum, um, then they do not need to complete that, but it's gonna be based on whatever your organization submitted and was approved. All right, so here are some tools pertaining to training. Uh, so this is the final curriculum form. Um, so some of you might be familiar with this, but this is submitted by your team uh, and just outlines what is the curriculum you are going to be offering, how many hours is each module, um, what certificate is that module going towards. Uh, so all of this is submitted to us along with kind of instruction dates. And then these are, these. this document is what we use to then um, to add your modules to IWRS. So this is how we kind of populate those uh, for you. Next up is IWRS attendance. Um, so this is what attendance looks like in the system if you're entering attendance on a per person basis. Um, so you can see you can do the check-in and the check-out time. Um, we do not, so our team does not require you to do that kind of lunch start and end. However, the system may require you to do that if uh, your training is, uh, I believe it's seven and a half hours because the system is set up um, to automatically state that someone needs to have a half an hour lunch. Um, so if your training is that long, the system may require you to put a lunch start and lunch end time. Um, if it's less than that, the system will not require you to do that, but just something to note if the system's asking you uh, for those hours. Next up is our attendance roster. So uh, all of our programs is kind of a best practice. Um, all training programs should have kind of a kind of a wet signature roster uh, so that you can keep track of who was in the room. Um, some of you I know do this electronically, that's fine as well, uh, but we do provide this uh, roster template if you wanna utilize it. If you have your own template, that's fine as well. Uh, we just ask that once you are finished with the program, everything's complete, that you make sure all of these rosters are uploaded to IWRS. Uh, you'll upload these into your provider info page. Uh, so if you are a program administrator, you have access to the provider info page uh, and you can just upload all of these into that space um, instead of, you don't need to do it per participant. Just wanna make that clarification. So this is your post-assessment score. So once someone has completed their post-assessment for each of their modules, you will add their score in here. Uh, if someone needs to retake a module, uh, so if this is less than 70%, they need to retake the module, you'll just add another post-assessment and the system will go off of the most recent post-assessment score. So you do not need to delete the first one or wait to enter it just go ahead and enter that score, and then you can add uh, in the remake or the redo if it needs to be added. 
So next up is our stipend policy. Uh, so again, this is just a template for you. If you want to use our stipend policy, feel free. Uh, many of you might have your own policy and your own procedure, uh, but we do provide the policy here as well as a kind of a procedure document. Uh, where we outline kind of a sample procedure, uh, how that would look with a fake organization, and then kind of a um, invoice type thing, uh, pay stub, if you want to call it that, uh, for a participant. So again, these are all just example items that are, are available to you and your teams. All right, so once they, uh, you know, are, are working through uh, their instruction. Again, if a participant falls below attendance or post assessment thresholds, that's when your student support service coordinator is going to start to get involved. Uh, so obviously, uh, if if your student states that they need tutoring or they need assistance, they can you know go to the student support service coordinator prior to this point. Uh, but most of the time, we are seeing those student support co service coordinators are getting involved once someone has kind of fallen below a threshold. Uh, so those services that can be offered, um, this is not an exhaustive list, but makeup hours or tests, test retakes, um, if someone needs additional test taking time or they need to take their test away from other people. Um, I know sometimes there's test anxiety or people just can't really handle kind of other noise around them. All of that is, is totally fine if they need that environment to succeed. Um, and then tutoring as well. So again, this is not an exhaustive list, um, but these are just some examples of things that might be offered. And then um, towards the end of the program or towards the end of each of your, your modules as people earn their certificates, uh, your data entry coordinator is gonna be uploading verification documents. So you know, as they earn their first aid CPR, you want to upload that document. As they get their OSHA 10, you want to upload that document um, to Vangelis Point. If there's flagger or forklift, if there's other certificates, uh, you want to upload those as well. And then your main curriculum. So NCCR, MC3, or ICCB, um, any of those you want to make sure to upload a document for. So that's just verifying that those individuals earned those certificates. Um, and it's really important to make sure that all of those certificates are either, if they're coming from you, that you get a scan of them. Uh, if they're coming from a third party, you wanna ask that third party to either send those cards directly to you um, or those documents directly to you so you can take a scan of them uh, before giving them to the participants. Um, Otherwise, you're going to kind of be chasing the participants a little bit. So uh, just kind of a, a helpful tip <laughs> from, from me to you from what we saw last year. Uh, so here are, again, uh, some kind of sample documents. So this is a policy uh, for extenuating circumstances. So if someone needs to make up post assessments or make up a session, um, if you want to utilize this type of policy for what's kind of an excusable absence or not. Again, this is just a sample, so you're not uh, required to use this policy uh, if you have something internally already. And then uh, we also have uh, this sample makeup session and post assessment policy. Again, um, if you have something internally uh, that you want to utilize, you can utilize that as well. But this is just really outlining, you know, what happens if someone misses an instruction session uh, or they don't meet their threshold for post assessments, whatever that might be. Then this is just a sample. Uh, so you can see kind of our student support services here. This individual had tutoring added to their, um, their career plan. Just as a reminder, um, this is something that's going to need to be added manually. So if you do offer tutoring, you just need to go onto that participant's profile and add in tutoring. It's not like wraparound services where it auto generates uh, because this is gonna be based on kind of that person's um, situation and what might be happening throughout the program. So just remember, if you offer a student support service, make sure to add that into IWRS um, under their support service goal. And then this is just a couple of examples of what would be acceptable for uh, completion verification. So we have 
you know, this is a NAB2 certificate. Um, this is the NCCR official transcript. So you can see kind of all of the, the modules that were completed. We don't have any at the bottom that are listed as incomplete. Um, then we have our OSHA card um, and first aid uh, documentation as well. So um, any of these, there's variations on these, but you know, this is just to give you kind of a gist of what we would accept as verification for those certificates. All right, so now we're getting towards the end of training. Uh, so about three to four weeks prior to the end of the program, the transition service coordinator is going to complete what we call the pre-transition career assessment. So this career assessment is the exact same questions as that orientation career assessment. And the role of this assessment is to understand, is that person still not feeling confident in interviewing and, and we need to intervene to get more mock interviewing or to work with them one-on-one? -on -one? Does this person still need their resume updated? Have their goals changed? Have their interests in certain trades changed? And the reason that we do this about three to four weeks prior to the end of the program is because your transition service coordinator is gonna start to create these kind of customized transition plans for your participants. So if they're seeing, we have a lot of participants that are interested in carpentry, a lot of participants who are interested in electrical, this is when that transition service coordinator is gonna start activating their network and ensuring that they have connections with whoever they need to have connections with to make sure that that participant can apply to a registered apprenticeship program, to get you know interim employment, to get construction employment, whatever their goals are. Um, that's why this is happening about a month before the end of the program. So your transition service coordinator has enough time to really not only set up these plans, but start to activate these plans. Uh, so again, this is where they're developing that transition plan, um, and that transition plan is IWRS based. Um, so when I'm talking about a plan, there's no document that you're looking for. We don't need anything submitted like that, um, but it's going into IWRS and adding in any services that might need to be provided to that person under that transition service goal. Uh, so that's where you're going to be adding things like resume prep, uh, help with job search, um, apprenticeship application assistance, you know, whatever those might be. But that's where we're going to be looking for that plan. It is not a separate document, just in IWRS. So based on that participant transition plan, the transition service coordinator is going to activate that partner network to really try to work those relationships and help those participants get in where they need to go. Uh, so I just wanted to show you kind of this pre-transition career assessment. Uh, so again, this is just going to be on that intake page. Uh, you do not need to do a paper copy this time. Just do it straight into IWRS. Uh, you'll click add career assessment and then you'll complete the career assessment like you did on the first one. All right, so I'm going to pause here before I get into program completion. Are there any questions about instruction and training? Feel free to unmute or, or put a question in the chat. Okay, all right. So now we're at the end of our program. Uh, the data entry coordinator is going to go ahead and assign that final status to this person. Um, so when we're talking about final statuses, what we mean is, are they complete? Are they complete and in transition or are they incomplete? Uh, so if they're complete in IW, um, if you change them to complete in IWRS, what that means is that person is, has successfully completed the program. They've earned all their certificates. They've done attendance, post assessments, all of that, but they're just unsure of where they're going with their transition. So they may still be kind of up in the air about when they want to transition. They may be still up in the air if they want to apply or they want to go for construction, uh, just employment or what they want to do. Um, and so in that stage, if someone's just going to be complete, uh, the grant is still going to, or the grantee uh, staff will continue to work with that person and try to help them determine what their next step is. 
if they're complete and in transition, that means that that person, that individual has successfully completed the program and they know where they want to go. They know that they want to go to a registered apprenticeship program. They know they want to go uh, to a secondary outcome, whatever that might be. Um, and in that instance, the grantee staff is just going to secure some sort of transition verification documents from that individual. Uh, so if they're going to register an apprenticeship program, that's where you're getting, you know, confirmation of their application. You're getting um, acceptance to the registered apprenticeship program. If they're going to just employment, you want to get an offer letter, a pay stub, whatever that might be, some sort of documentation to show that that transition has taken place. And then if they're incomplete, that means that for some reason they have not finished the program. So this could be they left in the middle of the program. Uh, this could be they were asked to leave. Um, or it could be that they were in the program the whole time, but they still have some pending items. So they still need to finish a, a module. They need to go back and retake a post assessment. Um, and in that instance, the, the staff is going to continue to work with them and hopefully get them um, to the point where they have successfully completed the program and all of their certificates. And so here is just where you're gonna be choosing kind of that final status. Your data entry coordinator is gonna choose the, the final overall status for the participant. Uh, and again, complete and uh, complete in transition and incomplete are the, the primary three that you're gonna be using at this stage. Um, and your data entry coordinator will kind of work with your program staff to determine what's the appropriate status for that individual. Uh, this is on the participants profile on the program completion and follow up tab. So that is where you will find this. You will select add program um, status or add completion status. And this is the window that will show up. Now, if someone is incomplete, so they did not finish the program, they left the program voluntarily, um, we do ask that if you can secure an exit interview with them, um, please do so. We understand sometimes people just drop off and it's impossible to get them to respond to you. Um, but if you are able to get an exit interview questionnaire with those participants, uh, this is a great tool to understand, you know, was there a specific reason they were leaving? Was there something that can be improved? Uh, were there support services that they needed that weren't provided? Um, sometimes it's just helpful to get feedback on kind of what worked well in the program so you can continue to, to do that. Um, again, if you can get this, please try to um, make a couple of attempts uh, and you can record those as case notes in IWRS. And if you can't get it, you know, we, we understand sometimes it's just difficult to get that. So finally, this is where your transition service coordinator is going to be uh, working with those participants to successfully complete with any transition needs. Um, so job searches, apprenticeship application assistance, mock interviewing, resume prep, um, introducing them to registered apprenticeship programs, to unions, to employers, uh, based on those transition plans, whatever that participant's going to need. And so here you can see uh, this is our, our program completion follow-up tab on our participants page. Um, and this is where the transition tracking is going to take place. Uh, so when you make someone complete and in transition, you'll fill out that questionnaire where it just outlines where they're going. And all of that is tracked here with these little green check marks on their program completion page. And then here's your transition support services. So again, just a reminder, when we say transition plan, this is what we're looking for. So we want to see transition services added in IWRS. That is what we consider a transition plan. So anything that that participant needs as part of their transition will be added as a service here. And then here are just a couple samples of transition verification documents. So uh, one is an applicant testing page. So that confirms that this participant did apply uh, to a registered apprenticeship program. And the other one is a promissory note. Uh, so that one is stating that they uh, are now enrolled in a, in a registered apprenticeship program. Um, and in that case, they were uh, sponsored into that program. Uh, and then we get into follow-up. So 
The transition service coordinator is going to stay in touch with these participants. Uh, we ask for um, a contact every 90 days for the first year. Uh, obviously, you may have kind of more um, consistent contact than that with them. Um, but this is the period that we call active tracking follow up. And that's going to begin when the participant graduates from the program. Then you'll follow up every 90 days for the first year. So there will be a total of four kind of active tracking questionnaires that get completed. Those questionnaires are in IWRS on the program completion and follow up tab. Uh, and they are going to mirror the complete and in transition questionnaire. So it's going to be asking them where are they at? Did they go to a registered apprenticeship program? Are they now, you know, off of the wait list and they're, they've been enrolled? What trade are they in? Are they working? It'll just ask them kind of basic information like that. And then after the first year, um, our team will go ahead and update their status to long-term active tracking. Uh, so long-term active tracking essentially means that we are now going to be tracking them. Uh, so our team, as well as our partners at Northern Illinois University's Center for Governmental Studies, are going to be tracking each of these participants uh, for a total of 10 years. And so we will be taking their um, information from the um, U.S. Department of Labor Rapid System. So that is a system that tracks apprentices. We will also be utilizing uh, the Illinois Department of Employment Services uh, to track participants as well. And we're really trying to understand the outcomes of these participants. Uh, so you all will be helping us with that first year, and then we will be kind of taking on the following nine years uh, of tracking those participants. So here is that active tracking questionnaire. Again, this is on the program completion and follow-up tab on an individual's pro, uh, profile. It is all the way at the bottom of that page. You will just select add active tracking uh, at that 90 day, those 90 day intervals. Complete uh, the questionnaire uh, with as much information as that person can provide to you. Uh, and then you'll press save and then follow up with them in another in another 90 days. And that is all I have for you um, as far as our presentation today. I did want to just share with you um, a job aid. Um, so this is something that actually this um, design was based off of. Um, so I'm sharing a link in the chat right now. So this is actually um, this document, and and let me actually just go ahead and pull it up for you. Share my screen with you here. So this document is going to walk you through, go, is going to walk you through um, outreach through enrollment. So it mirrors the PowerPoint that we just went through um, and it goes, you know, step by step here all the way through beginning instruction. And it also provides some resources and links. Uh, but on the second page, the second and third page here, each of these numbers is going to correlate with a stage here. Uh, so number one is engage with your potential participant. And under each of these, it's going to give you kind of what should be happening at this stage, um, available templates that you can utilize, as well as what section in the grantee manual you can look at to address that step. Uh, so it's really meant to be kind of interactive and kind of get to the heart of uh, what should be happening at each of these stages with the staff and where you can get more information uh, if you want to, you know, dig a little bit deeper into each of these. Um, so again, this one just goes through uh, the beginning of instruction. Um, I'm working on the part two, which is uh, instruction through follow up. Uh, so that will be out soon. Uh, but this job aid is available for you and your team right now on the Illinois Works Partner Guide if you want to utilize that. So let me just stop here. Are there any, any questions from anyone that I can answer right now?
feel free to unmute if you would like. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining today. Um, if you could just take one second, I know we're over time due to our uh, technical issues early on, um, and just fill out this survey for me. Um, I am always trying to come up with kind of relevant topics for all of you, what, what's helpful for you um, that you're dealing with on the ground that we can kind of give guidance on or if we can bring out outside parties to help you. Uh, so please just take a minute to complete the survey and just let me know um, if this was helpful today and then if you have any ideas for kind of future um, sessions. Um, I am debating next month doing kind of a similar overview walkthrough of IWRS um, from beginning to end. Um, so if you are interested in that, if that sounds good to you, if you could put that on the survey and just let me know that that would be helpful. Um, but other than that, that is all I have for you all today. So thank you so much for uh, spending your morning with me. Uh, I will post this recording um, hopefully this afternoon uh, to our Illinois Works Partner Guides. So you'll have this along with the slides uh, and that job aid is already there. So thank you all so much uh, for joining today. I hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday.